Now, welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are going to be in um, Psalm 34. If you'll turn there, Psalm 34. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Uh, thank you for the prayers for Norma. Uh, she's doing well. Um, she is uh, um, home. She had her uh, procedure to take care of the aneurysm and everything looks good so far. And she's home and, and like I say, feeling pretty strong. So we thank you for prayers there. Continue praying for Richard Souza dealing with some blockages in his heart, had a stent put in. Ron Hickman recovering from his stent and other requests that we've been bringing you. But God's done a great job in, in hearing our prayers and, and uh, people are doing well. Maria's home. And so we thank you for those. And I've been praying for those requests. We just thank you, Lord, for your answered prayers. I ask you to bless our study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so welcome once again to our midweek Bible study. It's August 28th, 2024. Uh, so I want you to look at Psalm 34. We're going to try to cover a couple chapters today, although chapter 34 probably is a standalone chapter. But I want you to look at verse 1 of chapter 34. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And if you look at chapter 35, the last verse in chapter 35 says, my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Reminds me of that blessed assurance song. This is my story. This is my song, praising my savior all the day long. So we're going to bookend these two chapters with this idea of the praise of God being on our lips. And when we look at the uh, circumstances surrounding these psalms, you'll see that it's it's quite a uh, testimony of David that to be praising God during this time. So Psalm 34 says it's a psalm of David at the beginning when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So that background is in First Samuel 21. Well, let's look at that because once we get the background what's happening in these two psalms, um, it will really uh, benefit us. And so in 1 Samuel 20, you know, we have the, the convincing of Jonathan by David that his father, Jonathan's father, Saul, King Saul, truly is jealous of David, and uh, he wants to kill him. And so if you read that chapter, it's the ch chapter where Jonathan shoots the arrow to let David know whether he should run or stay. So he runs. As he runs, he comes to Halimelech, the priest, in the beginning of chapter 21. And uh, he convinces Ahimelech that he's on a mission from Saul. And, and he is given the showbread. And uh, God uses that in the New Testament as an example of not being legalistic. But he gives him the showbread and then... In verse 9, he gives him the sword of Goliath. And so he begins his journey of running from King Saul. And when he does, in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 21, he arose and fled. David arose and fled uh, before King Saul and went to Achish, uh, the king of Gath. Well, why is that important? Well, Gath is where the Philistines are from. It's also where Goliath was from. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands? And David took these words to heart and was very afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So David's reputation precedes him. And now, um, there is revenge on their mind. And so they bring him to this king, and David's afraid. So he pretended madness in their hands, scratched at the doors, let his saliva fall down his beard. Achis said to his servants, look, this man is indeed insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come to my house? Get him out of here. So David, therefore, in chapter 22, departed and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. So now 
This is the circumstances behind Psalm 34. David is in a cave. He has been chased out by King Saul because of his jealousies. He can't really go anywhere because he is, remember, a bloody man. He's been in many wars and skirmishes and has been victorious. And so there's a lot of revenge on the minds of people. So he pretends that he's crazy, and then he goes into this cave. And as he's in this cave, he writes this song uh, alone and on the run and rejected by what was once his friend. And he says in verse one, I will bless the Lord at all times. And this is a key to victorious Christian living, if you want to call it that. Um, if we have a sovereign God that controls the universe, that loves you and all things work together for good, in Romans 8, 28, and we truly believe that, then in all circumstances, we can really praise God. Now, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I was, whenever we go through these things, I, I do self-evaluation on these, you know, and, and I don't want to be a hypocritical preacher, and I don't think that I am. I will say that I don't always practice what I preach, and many will define that as hypocrisy. But I will tell you that that it, it had dawned on me years ago that the very definition of a Christian is a sinner who humbly surrenders to God because he's a wretched, uh, sinful human being. And my flesh dwells no good thing. I'm fully aware of that. So because I don't pretend to be anything except a sinner who believes that the scripture is true and my opinions are wrong, as long as I'm preaching the scripture, um, you know, that you can, all of us are trying our best that are following Christ to live like Christ. But we will tell people, you know, love your enemy. When we have issues with our enemy, well, love your enemy is still true because it's not your opinion. I'm not saying it's my opinion. I'm saying God says, love your enemy. So let's all work on this together. And so because of that, David can bless the Lord at all times. And, and uh, so my point is that, that I, I don't ever blame God for, for any of the trials, but I do get frustrated with them. And I, I'm not always rejoicing in tribulation. Um, I am, especially over the last couple of years, I find myself to be more and more frustrated. I don't like it. I don't like that side of me. Uh, I'm praying about it and asking God to do a work. I don't know if it's, a physical thing or, or a mental thing, but uh, uh, spiritually, boy, I just trust in God. I know everything's got a purpose. I'm not worried about the election. I'm not worried about the death. I'm not worried about those things. Uh, but I do find myself being uh, increasingly um, more down, and I don't like it. So, But I will praise his name continually. Jesus is great. Nothing in my life that that is a frustration or an, no, an issue is his fault. My mouth shall make its boast to the Lord. Uh, the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. What a beautiful, uh, and it's, it's more beautiful when you realize where he is and what he's going through. And I can be angry and I can be frustrated and I can be depressed. Um, and still be praising the Lord. I, I just, I, because it's not him. And I wrestle with those emotions. I don't like them. I know they're wrong. I know they're, they're, there's something I want God to fix in me. So verse four, um, he says, I sought the Lord and he heard me um, and delivered me from all of my fears. So there's a, there's a moment of peace for David. I like that. I want to be delivered from, from those. Uh, they looked to him and were radiant. Who's they? Well, anybody who humbled themselves and looks to the Lord, there's a radiance. I really like the word countenance. If you look at it through scriptures, your your that face of peace, that face of uh, of joy. The poor man uh, cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. That's me. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. That's an interesting verse because it's, is it speaking of guardian angels? 
the Bible says in Hebrews that we entertain angels unawares. We know that uh, Michael fought with Satan for the body of Moses. We read about that in Jude. And so we know that there are angels doing the work. And we know that God put a hedge around Job, but we don't know what that hedge actually looked like. But we do have uh, a God who is our deliverer, a God who is our salvation. And when we are in his presence, our countenance, our face changes. Um, number 624, it's a great verse. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And that's where this radiance is. It's this idea of the of peace and, and boy, there's something about you. You look different. I, and I've known that there's a, uh, a couple of times when I'm uh, talking to somebody, um, not necessarily counseling, but somebody going through a difficult time. Um, I'll see them, especially someone I know very well. And I say, hey, are you okay? And they'll say, why? Why do you say that? I said, I don't know. It's just there's something you look there's a look about you or other days I say, boy, you look like a man of peace today. And so that, that countenance we see, um, it happened to Moses. Remember when he went to the mountain, Exodus 34, 30 says, Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. And, um, uh, there is a, there is a physical, it's hard to explain, but it's just a physical peace in your face when you connected with Christ. Um, someday, you know, this veil will be taken off and we'll see Christ face to face. And I can't imagine what that'll be like when his true glory shines. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.15, even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from the glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. We look in the mirror and we see the difference. You can see someone who without Christ. And, and it was an interesting thing. Um, um, this is probably too personal, but excuse me, there, there, there's, I went through a really um, difficult time <clears throat> with personal things when I was in uh, junior high. Um, some things that, that changed the rest of my life. And it, it's interesting, my school picture in, in sixth grade and my school picture in eighth grade, there's a visible difference in the countenance of that, that young man uh, of happiness to just, you can see the, the pain on the face. And so there is a countenance. And, and someday that countenance, that, that, that glory of God, that we pray that it shines upon us, that we have that peace that passes all understanding. Uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, we see in a glass dimly or a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. So there'll be a, imagine those moments where the, the radiance of God kind of fills our soul and, and comes out in our countenance. Uh, imagine just being there with him for eternity. Uh, our face will be shining, I think, for eternity in the presence of God, for sure. Oh, uh, and he says in verse 8, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I really like Psalm 34 and 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 119.03 says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's an interesting thing how the Bible works. To those who reject God, turn away from him, don't know him. Uh, these words can be offensive. They, they are convicting or they bring a little bit of nervousness. Uh, but to those who know God, these verses are like honey. It's like candy as we read about how great God is. And so we're 
constantly asking people, just read a little bit, just, just taste a little bit. And if you only knew God the way I know God, uh, First Corinthians, First Peter 2, 2 described it this way. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So the Bible becomes like milk to a baby. It's, it's needed. It's sustenance. We crave it. We want to hear more and want to know more. Um, Hebrews 6, 4 says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of it by the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. And, and there's an impossibility here. That if you've really tasted and been enlightened by God, uh, to fall away and then come back. Right? You can't, it, if you're enlightened, you're enlightened. Um, and if you've tasted God and, and, and uh, uh, the heavenly gift to become partakers of the Holy Spirit, you're changed for life. It's just a change for life. So taste and see the Lord is good. It's an interesting thing to write down from a cave, but it's certainly, I remember when, the apostles, Jesus would come to them and, and early in the book of Acts and they would go to their, their fellow fishermen and friends and they would say, you know, just come and see, come and see, you know, the, the Samaritan woman, come and see the man who knew, told everything about me, just come and see. And that's what we're begging people to do. Just, just read a little bit, read the book of John, read John chapter three, taste and see the Lord is good. Verse 9, he says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall lack, shall not lack any good thing. This is the seek ye first the kingdom of God verses and all these. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. The lions are lack and they may suffer hunger, but those who trust God, um, Psalm 37, 25 says, I've been young and I've been old, and yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Seek your first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. These are all still applicable to us. But you got to choose God. That's the whole point. David is being chased by the wicked uh, being chased by the evil, and he ends up in a cave. And he writes this psalm of praise and of trust and of acknowledgement of who great, how great God is. But that's a choice you have to make. He says, look at, come to your children. Listen to me, verse 11. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Just come. Let me tell you how great he is from this cave. <laughs> Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Well, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And if you're going to seek peace, it's only the peace of God that passes all understanding. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, delivers them from their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. So there has to be a decision to make. Are you going to be pridefully stand against God and say you don't need him, you're fine without him? You know, choose this day whom you will serve as for me in my house. We'll serve the Lord. But if you come face to face with your sin, come face to face with your need for a Savior, come face to face with your acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is the Lord, then humble yourself. And uh, David says this in Psalm 51. He says, he says to God after, and this is David coming face to face with his sin, with Bathsheba and murder and adultery. And he says, you do not desire sacrifice or I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offering. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So I talked earlier about, you know, I try to be honest about some of the things I've gone through over the last couple of years. It's emotions uh, that I don't like. Um, and they break my heart that, that they're there. I don't like them. And I confess them as sin to God. Uh, but they at times seem uncontrollable. And uh, there's no rhyme or reason for them. So just, you know, well, John, just cheer up. Well, that that's easier said than done. And so, um, but I come to God with a broken and contrite heart, you know, um, asking him to help me walk me through it. And, and I know that he will. Um, so whether they're, um, like I said, emotional or whether they're physical, spiritual, um, we'll, we'll, we're working on it, you know, but until then I'll just praise his name every day and lift him up and do the work that he's called me to do and, uh, and, uh, try to get that physical part in, intact. Um, but when there's sin, the difference is, you know, we're all sinners, but one with God, one with the Holy spirit, it breaks our heart. We don't like disappointing our Lord, you know, and, and uh, we don't like, uh, hurting his testimony. And so, so just have that broken and contrite heart. How do you, you know, you may have made mistakes, but how does it make you feel? Do you care? I don't care. You know, I'm going to, you know, we, we live in a culture and a world where there's so much violence and theft and, and anger and, uh, and rage that uh, we wonder if people have a conscience at all. Do they have a seared conscience where they can injure another human being or take from another human being? It doesn't bother them uh, in this world today. Uh, that's a problem. God wants a broken and contrite heart. Uh, he closes this chapter. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's for sure. But the Lord delivers them out of all. They'll be delivered someday, you know, and, and uh, someday I'm going to be a new body with no pain, no suffering. Someday we'll be in a place where uh, we'll be delivered from this. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Uh, and, and that bones, is, it's a picture of, of strength. And But God uses this verse um, Later on in scripture, when he's describing about uh, um, Jesus on the cross, none of his bones were broken and they would come and uh, those on the cross, if, if they were not, they needed to be, you know, dead by sundown. If they weren't, they'd come and break the legs that would keep them from pushing up and taking breaths. But when they got to Jesus, he, was, he had already given up his spirit to God. And so his bones were not broken. He didn't, they didn't have to do it. And um, this is used in the New Testament as a prophetic picture of Christ. Uh, evil shall slay the wicked, but those who hate righteousness shall be condemned. But the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. This is a, another prophetic Jesus verse where uh, now there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, so we will have the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. You know, we have been redeemed through Christ, but there's going to come a time where, where we'll get that full inheritance of heaven. John 19.36 says, these things were done that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. That's that prophecy in John 19.36. So what a what a uh, chapter as he writes from a cave about his praise for God and his salvation in the Lord, begging people to seek God, do what's right. And there is a time of choice for people at this time. They can follow the God of David, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or they can follow this, this king who has rejected God, who when he was humble, God blessed him, but now has turned violent. Jonathan had to make a tough choice, his father or his friend. And he chose the one whom he knew God was with. And that's what we're going to have to do. 
which brings us to Psalm 35. And David, we don't know. This may or may not have been at the same time. We don't know. There's no record. It simply says a Psalm of David, so we don't have a historical timeline for this Psalm. Uh, but it does uh, certainly apply. Where he says, plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. So this is what's called an imprecatory psalm. And simply a precatory psalms are those in which the author imprecates or uh, calls for calamity or destruction for his enemies. So, and, and it's very controversial what people today do. You know, we're supposed to love our enemies. You know, David uh, will we'll see him praying for his enemies in this chapter. But he's also praying for God to deliver him. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So <clears throat> there's evil in the world. And I want God to take care of it. I want God to be victorious over it. I want God to remove it. And so those are imprecatory prayers. And he says, Lord, um, plead with those who fight against me. Fight against me. Take hold of a shield and buckler. Stand up for my help. Draw out a spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. This is a, a psalm of protection. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. The angel of the Lord. There's that kind of idea of God watching over us or guardian angels, if you want to put it that way, or just the spirit of the Lord. We'll talk about, it. I believe this angel of the Lord speaks of a, of an Old Testament Christ. It says, let their way be dark and slippery. <laughs> let the angel of the Lord pursue them. Verse seven, without cause, they've hidden their net for me in a pit, which they've dug out without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly. Let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. God, would you defend me? Would you protect me? Would you uh, plead my cause? He starts his chapter out. And, and this is all pointing to Christ. He is our advocate. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's our advocate. In fact, Romans 8 describes it perfectly. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore is risen and is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. He is our defender. He is our advocate. He is our shield, our buckler. All those things the Bible describes him, sitting at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. And if God is, Jesus is for us, God is for us. Well, how are we going to lose this battle? Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, 1 John 4, 4. Samuel, or David says it this way in Samuel 20, 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. This goes all the way to the end of, of this. We, we saw the beginning of David's running. Now it's over in 2 Samuel 22. And he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength and whom I will, I, I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. We sing that beautiful round and church at times i will call upon the lord he's our refuge he calls him he is the rock he's the fortress he's my strength this is david asking in psalm 35 for him to be these things and then in second samuel 
we see that God has answered those prayers. Um, it's beautiful. Look what David does in verses 9 through 14. And, and this is a, a convicting part for us, but I think it, it, it we resonate with this. He says, uh, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. My bones shall say to the Lord who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. God, you've already shown that you will do these things. Fierce witnesses rise up against me. They ask me things I don't know. They reward me evil for good. And the Bible says in the last days, what is good will be called evil. Evil will be called good. We definitely see that in our world today. To the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. My prayer would return to my own heart. Now remember David's relationship with Saul. Saul is the main adversary here. But remember, how did they even meet? Well, David defeated Goliath, and then David would play the harp when God would give King Saul the spirit of, of depression, the spirit of being down. And David would now, we see he was praying for him. This one he prayed for. This, one, this is why Jonathan couldn't believe that his father would be against David. But they didn't know how that simple song, Saul has killed his thousands and David is ten thousands, would have such an effect. And so David says, I, uh, this who I prayed for to the sorrow of my soul. Uh, he says, um, verse 14, I paced as about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one mourns for his mother. The Bible says in James 5 that the the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And this is a fervent prayer of David uh, for Saul and for his so-called friends that have now turned against him. And we've had the same thing. We pray for those. We pray for our family who won't talk to us. Uh, we pray for our loved ones and friends who think we're foolish for following Christ. Uh, we pray for our children and grandchildren who once... Uh, went to church with us and now tell us we're wrong and we're fools and we pray for them. Um, and uh, some of those will turn so against the, us that they, the, uh, Saul did. He was violent and wanted David um, silenced. But David prays fervently as he always has. Remember David, when he had chances to kill Saul, he wouldn't touch God's anointing tried it and begged him to stop and pleaded with him, why, what have I done? Um, it's hard when the world turns against us. Um, so in clothing, uh, as we look at the last verses of this chapter, the point is this, we need to pray for God's protection of the church, of the body, not our church, but the church as a whole. It's under attack all over the world today. And he says in verse 15, but in my adversity, they rejoiced. They gathered together attackers against me. I did not know it. They tore at me with their, and I didn't, and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from the destructions, my precious life from the lions. Uh, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I'll praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without cause. They do not seek, speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They open their mouth against the me and said, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. In other words, they falsely accused David. And that was the only way that Saul had to get people turned against him. It's, it's what we see in modern day politics. Aha, you said this 17 years ago. Aha, you did this. Aha, you laughed at this. And they try to just uh, belittle, derail, derail, and, and uh, they'll do that with the church. Verse 22, this you've seen, O Lord. Praise God, he sees everything. 
Do not keep silence. Do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, O God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O my God, according to your righteousness. Let them not rejoice over me. This is the imprecatory type of prayer. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we've swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice in my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and all dishonor who exalt themselves against me. You say, well, that sounds kind of selfish, but, but it's truth. If you're walking in righteousness and trying to share the gospel to a dying world, uh, to a world that needs a savior, uh, we got to pray, Lord, protect us, guard us, be our shield, be our fortress. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. So not only is he praying for God to protect them from the evil, but that the righteous would be exalted. The meek will inherit the earth. In that verse we started with, and my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and your praise all day long. This was David's prayer in Psalm 51, 12. This is, we'll close with this, but it's, it's pretty eye-opening. He's dealing here in Psalm 51 differently. Psalm 35, it's, it's the enemy against him that, that he has no responsibility. He didn't do anything wrong, didn't deserve it. Praying for God's protection and righteousness and, and uplifting. Psalm 51, he is in a mess because of his own actions, his, his sin. But he still cries out to God. And he says to him in Psalm 51, 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors your way. Sinners will be converted. Deliver me from the guilt and bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. God, protect me in Psalm 35 so I can uh, teach others about you and, and talk of your righteousness all day long. In Psalm 51, it's, oh, God, forgive me so I can teach people. I like how he says, he says, the Lord, if you just take, restore to me the joy of my salvation, let me get back in fellowship with you. Deliver me from guilt and bloodshed, and my tongue shall sing about your righteousness. I'll teach transgressors your ways. And, and that's one thing that happens when we fall into sin and we're delivered and forgiven and restored we can tell people about how great God is and what he will do for them as the same God works in the same way with all those who humble themselves. That he will lift you up. So let me encourage you today. Maybe you're uh, under attack. Maybe you're in a, a place where those who were once dear to you now have rejected you. Uh, just call upon the Lord, that broken and contrite heart. Continue praying for them. Uh, as a mother prays and mourns for a child. And if you're still trying to figure out what side you're on, just remember the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, he's risen from the dead, you'll be saved. Trust in him. Get on the right side. He's going to deliver the righteous and to heaven. And their faces are going to shine. Their countenance are going to be changed. And the wicked and the evil will someday I'll be like the chaff in the wind. And when the vengeance and the, and the wrath of God comes, you know, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. He that has the Son hath life. He that has not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Make sure you're on the right side. Make sure you have trusted in the God who created you, the Lord who died for you, and the Holy Spirit that wants to dwell within you and give you the love, joy, peace, and gentleness, and kindness, and all those things that come with it. Lord, we thank you, Father, so much for these two chapters that really lay it out perfectly as we pray, Lord, for your protection from those who hate you, from those who are persecuting you, and as a result, trickles down to your body, your church. Um, and we just pray, Lord, for protection salvation for our enemies, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will talk to you soon.